हेलो एवरीवन सो टुडे वी आर ट्राइंग टू डिस्कस द न्यूरो एनाटमी फॉर न्यूरल इंजीनियरिंग सो इट्स अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक एंड आई वुड से वेरी वाइटल पार्ट ऑफ द इंटायर कोर्स बिकॉज टू थिंग्स बेसिकली ओनली वेन यू अंडरस्टैंड a bit about the entire structure of the brain at least grossly then you will understand the various uh, anatomical details of the rodent experiments that we are going to discuss further and moreover when you understand the gross uh, structure of the brain you will also try to uh, you can uh, you can frame the research question better for example many of you are planning to take up the uh, neural engineering seriously or many of you probably would be considering the phd proposals so those of you are already into phd then you can actually try and choose whatever we are going to uh, teach in this course but at least for a beginner who is trying to uh, frame a research question it's very important to uh, you know get to know the details of the uh, brain anatomy um, so as i said you can frame a research question and once you frame a research question there are a lot more um, translational aspect that you can actually think of when you know the actual structure of the brain so that's the um, a brief introduction of uh, today's um, uh, lecture so now we can uh, start uh, looking into the details of the anatomy initially um, i'll deal with the uh, gross anatomy of the human brain then uh, gradually we'll move on to the rodent's anatomy in with comparisons with uh, human anatomy so uh, it's a very fascinating organ and this is the gross three dimensional structure of the brain so what i would uh, like to emphasize is basically the uh, the three dimensional orientation of the brain so as a neurosurgeon i really don't get to see the entire brain at one go we'll be making a very small opening in one part of the uh, skull and will be accessing very specific areas of the brain so that brain at large is protected and that is how we sort of uh, give them the benefit of the surgery at the same time protecting their uh, functional outcome you know if i am trying to operate on a motor area the visual areas and other area which i am not exposing are protected so that's why it's, it's very important to understand the anatomy before we, before we actually open up the skull so having said that i'll go to the um, next slide so this particular lecture is uh, outlined in uh, this manner with the brief introduction i'll be introducing you to the anatomy of cerebral lobes deep gray matter nuclei white matter networks imaging of those networks and of course i'll sum it up with the comparison with rodent anatomy so after this comparison in subsequent uh, lectures we'll go in detail with the rodent neuroanatomy and those uh, experiments so maybe it's a repetition but i would what i would want to emphasize is that unless we understand uh, the detailed uh, structure of the rodent brain the rodent experiments that we are trying to consider and thereby the neural data that one is going to collect is going to be really difficult unless we try to understand the entire structure that is under study so having said that Uh, why is it really important uh, to know the deep gray matter nuclei and white matter networks so it not just the gross anatomy deep gray matter nuclei uh, is of great interest in the research interest uh, as the parkinsonism and the disorders like alzheimer's disease are the gold mine of research nowadays and those are all degenerative diseases which really uh, demands a lot of translational research so unless we are familiar with those nuclei and those various anatomical jargons that are used it's very difficult to communicate or even write a paper on it and so even if you are a, a neural engineer or if you are a technology neurotechnologist or a computational neuroscientist it is very important to understand the structure that you are going to deal with either be it a computational data or a structural data or a neural signal data where is this particular data is coming from and how is it going to benefit the society at large so all that is going to base on the uh, on i want to subjects uh, anatomical details so let's uh, skim through the um, uh, anatomy briefly human anatomy briefly uh, 
and then I will take you to the rodent uh, part of the anatomy. So, to begin with one would wonder what are the layers are uh, there before we actually approach the brain. Uh, it is very, very uh, important uh, because unless we plan as to how to approach the brain, the structure is going to get damaged. So, if we are planning for a craniotomy, then you need to know the layers that we are going to go through surgically. So, this is important again when we take you into the uh, rodent neuroanatomy, there again it is very important because brain is like a pink a soft jelly like structure. Unless until you handle these layers very carefully, you are going to inflict damage to the underlying brain. Because after we pass through a hard uh, skull, it is immediately the jelly like brain. So, one plunge deep into the brain is going to give a lot of damage. So, as, I, as you all can see here, so you all can uh, make out that these are all the uh, layers from outside inwards. So, one will start with the skin which is really thick, the human scalp is pretty thick and vascular and you have these various layers of subcutaneous tissue, aponeuritic layer, loose uh, connective tissue, then only comes the skull which is a very protective thick layer of bone and beneath which it is not uh, directly the brain. Between the brain and the skull, you have this potential uh, space of subarachnoid space where it is uh, it's made of the arachnoid layer or you can see the cobweb kind of structure which will encase multiple vessels, blood vessels supplying the brain. So, only after that this brain is going to come into picture. So, if I were to uh, show you the uh, uh, structure in the human skull, with this is a cadaveric uh, slice where you can see from top that is the uh, scalp layer which I just discussed about, that is the bone and you all can appreciate the arachnoid layer there. So, that is the arachnoid membrane, I mean the, the name comes from the spider web, so which in Latin is arachnoid, then this cortex comes into picture you all can differently make out the different layers within the cortex that is white matter and that is the grey matter. So, that is the cerebral cortex which holds information for all our well being and all our functions. This holds, this is like holds a soft, this is a hardware which has a software which is uh, changing throughout our life. So, that is what is uh, briefly the uh, different layers until we reach the brain and you can see there are blood vessels among different layers there. So, that is the blood vessel within the arachnoid space, here you can see a blood vessel dipping inside and then it branches out within the brain substance. So, this is very important to plan the particular surgical trajectory that we, uh, we would probably be planning, so that these vessels are protected and safeguarded and then only we can handle the uh, cortex, cerebral cortex. So, after the layers, if one need to uh, see uh, the different lobar structure. So, this is a brain as a whole here, this is the entire brain exposed after removing the skull and after removing the protective layers uh, which are dura and arachnoid, both has been removed to exp expose the uh, cerebral cortex. This is what is called as cortical gyri and you can see there are spaces in between each co cerebral cortical gyri. That is the, uh, that, that is known as sulcus which are deep uh, depressions in between gyri. So, one can uh, fathom if you have to unfold this entire cortical mantle, it is a huge sheet of co um, cerebral cortex. So, within the confines of the skull, it is enfolded multiple times and where multiple sulci holding a vast amount of cerebral cortex. Each of these sulci, this is the major sulci called sylvian fissure which holds a large number of gyri and large number of cerebral cortex within it. So, that is the beauty of the human brain, it is huge, it is the largest in the evolution of any species if you take. The human brain is pretty large and holds a large amount of cerebral cortex. So, grossly by this sylvian fissure and these arbitrary lines that you are seeing, it is divided into four major lobes, frontal lobe, 
parietal lobe, occipital and temporal. So, the beauty is that each lobar structure is in has its own uh, detailed functional importance. So, for example, temporal lobe here on the left side it, uh, it controls the language for a uh, human language which is a very specialized function uh, in the evolutional hierarchy. Occipital lobe here is in charge of the vision, parietal lobe is in charge of the uh, sensation, frontal lobe is in charge of the motor cortex that is a movement of uh, the uh, individual is, in, uh, is given charge for the frontal lobe. Apart from that you still see a large amount of the brain which are actually associative areas. There are frontal associative areas where the, the execution takes place, the planning takes place and all the major decisions are taken by the prefrontal lobes and there are parietal lobe association areas, there are temporal lobe association areas and the occipital lobe association areas. So, it is it is these association areas which makes uh, a human being very special species because not just they see a particular object, they associate with the past memory, they can associate with past sensation, a past experience and then make meaning out of it. So, and then the final output can come as visual output itself or th for that matter sorry motor output or a sensory output. So, there are various uh, importance for it. So, this is in um, grossly how the brain is divided and these are all the major lobes. Whereas, there is a fifth lobe which is hidden. So, that lobe is a called insular lobe there. It is called it is also called island of rail because this is separated and it is surrounded by the entirely thick cortical mantle. So, in other words in terms of development this is called neocortex and the, this is called pallium cortex and archi cortex which are uh, deep within the brain where evolutionally the frontal lobes and temporal lobes are overgrown to cover this particular lobe and that is called uh, that lobe is called insular lobe which is the fifth lobe. And what has been shown here is actually the hidden gyri within the sylvian fissure as I explained earlier. It is a large fissure cleft between the frontal, parietal and temporal lobes which holds this very important uh, gyrus called Heschel's gyrus. So, this is of importance because the auditory perception ultimately happens here. You know when a, an individual hears any sound the meaning of that particular sound is actually made out here. I mean it is not just this Heschel gyrus which is actually a terminal point of the auditory signals that would reach the brain. But from here the entire perisylvian network is involved in the process of language. So, in, in other words this large area here is the sensory perception area which is called Wernicke's area and then from there the fibers are projected anteriorly or into uh, to the front to the area called as Broca's area where a person hears the sound, understands it and then you know make a meaning of what has been said and then gives a response through Broca's area. So, that is the functional importance of this particular uh, region. So, the idea being that there are a large amount of hidden structures that are there deep within the brain and very uh, important to understand uh, what is the anatomical boundaries and the structure and the function that is involved when you handle such experiments. So, though the experiments are conducted in uh, rodents most of the time and this course is all about how we are going to infer any data that you collect from the rodent ultimately for the human translation. So, when it um, makes meaning out of it or when you try to translate that particular uh, question or hypothesis into humans this is where it all matters. So, what is the structure that you are dealing with and what the function that you are trying to study in detail. So, with that I will quickly run through the other important uh, surface of the brain which holds similarly a lot of important structure that is basal surface. We have finished with the lateral surface this is the basal surface that is base of the brain you know in other words bottom of the brain where you can see that is the 
uh, hippocampus. I am sure all, all of you must have heard hippocampus in, in some way or the other in various neural science experiments and there are n number of papers which keeps coming out with respect to the research in the hippocampus. So, this is like a gold mine of any sort of research. So, that is the hippocampus, uh, outwardly it is called uncus, that is the medial most part, the innermost part of the temporal lobe that is this, this, this whole part is a temporal lobe. If you will remember the lateral surface when we separated it forms the, the uh, inferior part of the sylvian fissure, the entire thing is temporal lobe. So, medial part of the temporal lobe is this hippocampus which is in uh, charge of which is in charge of our memories. This is where all our most of the memories are stored, but having said that memory again is a very um, sort of higher order of uh, cortical function. You know in the uh, order of cognition uh, is pretty large area of network. For example, there are working memory which are stored in um, uh, frontal lobe and there are memory for faces which are stored in this what is known as occipital temporal gyrus or fusiform gyrus. So, there are various structure of the brain which actually holds the information, but by and large our long term memory comes from the hippocampus that is shown here. And the lateral part of the hip, uh, temporal lobe again is involved in the process of language and formation of uh, new memory. So, that is about the basal surface uh, in general and you can see here in the center of the brain this is called a uh, brain stem. So, the, what has been shown here is actually the midbrain which other words called crus cerebri. Crus in Latin means leg, you know it is leg of the brain. It, the entire cortical mantle, the entire cerebral cortex stands on this and from here onwards it is pons medulla and then it continues downwards as spinal cord. So, that is in general the basal surface of the human brain. So, that is the hippocampus which uh, we discussed uh, just in the last slide. So, the idea of having this particular uh, slide is basically to emphasize that how our brain is oriented three dimensionally. It is very, very uh, vital to understand the three dimensional disposition of every single part of the brain. So, you need to understand what which is what is the long axis of that particular structure that is being studied uh, especially in rodents since we are dealing with rodents in this particular experiment. So, it is not that the uh, slice of uh, you know or the 2D uh, image that you are seeing is actually what is there in reality. So, in the beginning in the beginning of the introductory slide itself I said the entire brain is oriented three dimensionally. So, it is very difficult to have, very important to understand and of course, it is pretty difficult as well to understand initially, but as you start working with it, it is easy to grasp. So, here what we can see is the uh, hippocampus structure, it starts from the temporal lobe, goes along the medial wall of the atrium and becomes a fornicial bundle. So, it gets relayed into the anterior nucleus of thalamus, from there it gets gets into the brain stem and central core of nuclei. As I said, when a person recollects a per particular information that gets processed and then, then the various output can happen. So, that is the importance of having a three dimensional knowledge of any uh, structure of the brain that we are dealing with. Another system that that is of immense research interest is this limbic system. So, limbic system as I said is in is involved in various mental health uh, disorders as I said and then the de degenerative disorders like Alzheimer's or depression, anxiety, psychosis, you name it, this is one structure where everything ends. So, where you can see there are n number of nuclei that are involved here in the central core of the brain. So, it is not hollow. So, when you see a huge brain one would wonder what is in the center. Basically, it is full of uh, grey matter this is actually a different nuclei, I mean large cluster millions of neurons are within these uh, structure that you are seeing and then all these structures are imp uh, important for our day to day living. Any injury to this central part of the brain is detrimental to life and is and definitely it is life threatening. So, 
what is the research interest? As I said earlier, papier circuit and the various nuclei that are involved in the uh, limbic system is the basis of research in Alzheimer's disease and movement disorders like Parkinsonism. So, to go into the details of this structure a little bit, just to give a, as an example as to how this intricately arranged various circuits and nuclei are involved in the, uh, in the uh, disease of major depressive disorder. You know, what has been shown here is the middle forebrain bundle, which is actually a very important pathway, part of mesolimbic uh, dopamine reward system. It is the hypoactivity or and hyperactivity which will decide whether the person is going for anxiety or OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder or a depressive disorder. So, all those are functional disorders where the neurotransmitters involved in this particular reward system which goes wrong and then it manifests with various symptoms. They may not be structurally any problem uh, problems with it, but then it is the imbalance neuro in the neurochemistry of this particular circuitry which will manifest as various mental health illness. I mean this is just one example. So, another uh, example I can think of in the same um, you know circuitry is the Parkinsonism and Alzheimer's disease where they are all degenerative disease. Again there is an imbalance of neurochemistry and then it manifests as various functional disorders. So, it is not just brain tumors that which is affecting the brain, there are various n number of functional disorders like epilepsy and movement disorders and mental health illness where these kind of translational research has immense importance. So, it is all the more important to understand the various nuclei that are involved and to understand the brain and the entire uh, brain anatomy in general. So, as I said these, these kind of research has lot of translational value and after the, uh, many decades of research in this particular uh, field, we have now what is known as deep brain stimulation as a, as a major therapy for movement disorders. Before the invention of this, they used to create lesions, they used to destroy some part of the brain to alleviate some symptoms of movement disorders. Whereas now, we do not really have to do it, we still do it for patients who cannot really afford this expensive devices, we still do the lesioning. But by and large, this is the most preferable therapy, so deep brain stimulation therapy. So, this is sort of I would say uh, a final outcome of any of the research that we are going to uh, discuss in detail in later um, you know the coming part of the lecture series. So, we are trying to look at uh, neural engineering, which is actually a, a translational research where the rodent experiments are going to get translated finally into humans if we are considering you know this particular line of uh, research which is very in interesting and very very important when it comes to elevating various um, illnesses affecting the brain. So, deep brain stimulation as I said uh, it is involved in the therapy for movement disorders, mental health illness, epilepsy you name it there are n number of indications for deep brain stimulation. All that is done is to pass the electrode deep into the brain target that we just discussed and one of the target for movement disorder is subthalamic nucleus. So, subthalamic nucleus is involved in the Parkinson's disease. As I explained in the last few slides, you saw there are various circuitry which will you know have imbalance in the uh, neurochemistry where the depletion of dopamine leads to manifestation of you know bradykinesia that is slowness of the movement, a person will have tremors and will have involuntary movements where unwanted movements are happening and so patient I mean the person will have difficulty in holding a cup of uh, water or even to have food on by himself, dress himself, they will have difficulties in major or uh, day to day activities. So, they definitely do respond initially with drugs, but since it is a degenerative disorder these dopaminergic neurons are going to degenerate on, on a daily basis. So, at the end of around 5-6 years, the drugs will stop uh, working and drugs will not uh, you know drug will stop helping that particular person and they will benefit with these kind of deep brain stimulation therapies where we stimulate the uh, 
um, you know the end circuitry elements where they will continue to uh, improve with the imp uh, movements. So, the unwanted movements will be stopped and the movement that are much needed for the daily life activities will be supported by such stimulation therapy. What you are seeing here is the battery which is programmable which, which this will be implanted in the uh, chest wall you know just below the, your collar bone in the subcutaneous pocket none of these devices will be uh, seen outwardly. So, that is the importance of the research in the field of neural engineering. This is the kind of result that we do get with this kind of research. So, it is very important to understand the final outcome or final translation that is going to happen so that one can actually start thinking about the problem or a hypothesis in that particular line. So, that is the whole importance of today's lecture. So, having said that briefly now I will try to cover the white fibers which are actually the neural pathways which takes the information from one area of the brain to the other. It is very important to understand this as well because uh, nowadays it is mostly especially the functional disorders like epilepsy or even Parkinson's disease we are depending on the white fibers as well. So, for example, there is a functional imaging which I will be showing it in uh, next few slides where we can actually image these white fibers. White fibers are nothing but the axonal pathways. So, all of you probably knows the structural unit of the brain is neuron and the neuron has the axon and dendrites and the cell body itself. These are the axons are the ones which actually becomes white fibers. You know the uh, there are millions of axons grouped together to form white fiber bundles. So, in next few slides I will briefly touch upon the major uh, white fiber pathways which are vital for the uh, for vital for carrying the information from one part of the area to the other. So, this is like after you make a section of the uh, outermost part of the brain you will see this white structure and that is that is the reason why they call white fiber in first place. But in a uh, in an uh, alive patient in surgery we do not see such you know totally white uh, structure obviously because of the presence of the blood and the blood vessels it will be sort of pinkish white. So, this is a cadaveric brain where uh, the outermost shell of the cortex which I explained the frontal and temporal lid where you, you saw the hidden lobe of this insula. So, at that level if you remove the outermost layer this is what one can see you know. So, what what has been shown here is the superior longitudinal fasciculus. So, these are all just uh, Greek and Latin terminologies which only says superior that is above the upper structure longitudinal that is lengthwise from anterior to posterior from front to back longitudinal fasciculus that is bundle of fibers. So, this, this is the one which helps in carrying the auditory information to the uh, Broca's area and of course, when something has been said you yourself can hear it and understand the meaning of what has been said which is also important as a feedback. So, both to and fro fibers are connecting the temporal lobe to the frontal lobe. In other words, these are called arcuate fasciculus. Okay, and what has also been shown here is the insula, which I already said, which has long and short gyri within it. So as you go a bit deeper, you remove the insula, then you'll see what is known as extreme capsule. And what is also important is this uncinate fasciculus. It's very important. I mean, I'm pretty sure that even if you're not directly involved in the human brain surgeries or human brain, brain research even if it is an animal experiment you do come across such structures in rodent as well or even for that matter non-human primate models if you guys are considering for research you will come across these particular structures. Very vital structures which is connecting the temporal lobe to the frontal lobe involved in the memory which is uncinate uh, fasciculus. And then what is known as the extreme external capsule then comes the basal ganglia structure there putamen which is an important structure involved in the um, in a very important part of the basal ganglia and this is one of the structure we sort of uh, target for various lesioning purposes of movement disorders and that is the corona radiata which is a very vital uh, fiber bundle carrying our motor pathway. 
So, from the motor cortex first it becomes corona radiator, we can see where is radiating fiber bundle approaching the sensory, some amount of sensory uh, information also goes through it and it becomes internal capsule, then it goes through the brain stem into the spinal cord and reaches our hands and legs. So, these are the motor fibers and of course, there are many associative fibers in the parietal lobe and there is in the occipital lobe. And this is the anterior commissure bundle which connects the two temporal lobe all right. So, if you go bit deeper again you will see what is known as globus pallidus. This is what I was saying it is not hollow as you dissect you will see various such structures arranged three dimensionally. So, here they are going from outside inwards and keep removing the uh, structures slice by slice then you will see all such structures. This is called globus pallidus. We do what is known as pallidotomy which is actually a lesioning procedure for Parkinson's disease. For patients who do not you know who cannot afford um, a deep brain stimulation or for that matter if they are not a candidate for deep brain stimulation therapy, we create the radio frequency thermocoagulation lesioning in pallidum which will alleviate bradykinesia that is slowness of movement, their, improve, their movement will improve, their tremors can improve. So, optic radiation are the fibers which carries visual uh, inputs from the eye optic nerve, then it comes uh, geniculate bodies and then it goes straight into the occipital lobe. So, that is optic radiation. And this is exactly I said the internal capsule as you go in the corona radiator from the motor cortex goes in as internal capsule and then it gets into the brain stem. And these three uh, anterior, posterior, middle are the different segments of the optic radiations which are actually the visual pathways. So, briefly I would want to um, touch upon the connectivity matrix or connectivity maps. So, this again is a major um, research uh, subject nowadays because what you are actually seeing is the true uh, data, data set coming from the human connectome project. I am pretty sure anybody who is involved in the uh, neural research one or the other day you will come across the terminology called connectomes and connectivity, functional MRIs and diffusion tensor imaging. So, in next few slides I briefly touch upon imaging because even if it is a rodent experiment this course leads uh, uh, deals with the rodent experiments, there are opportunities where you can actually image even the rodent brain. There are papers coming out now with functional MRI of the rodent brain where before you actually implant any sensor into the brain, you can actually look at the functional part of the rodent brain and decide yes, this is the motor cortex, this is the sensory cortex. Then you can go ahead, go ahead and implant as per the coordinates. So, that is the beauty of the research that is happening now. So, briefly to talk with, so we can image these particular uh, white fibers which actually I showed in the cadaveric brains. In the structural uh, uh, structure of the brain, you all um, heard me saying about talking about discussing about this arcuate uh, fasciculus and superior longitudinal fasciculus. These are those language fibers which are mapped here, where there are frontal uh, set of um, you know targets where this fiber ends, and then you have temporal lobe fibers and the optic radiation fiber which are seen here. So, all these are interconnected for language. So, but predominantly it involves frontal and temporal lobe areas and these are all arcuate uh, fasciculus with different components. So, you can see here what is known as dorsal pathway and ventral pathways in the language network itself. So, it is that complex. If you can see almost two third of the entire brain is involved in the language production. It is very important because a person has to talk from the memory use use the visual input that a person is getting and that is also conveyed into the language area. Then there is modulation that happens, tone modulation that can happen before something has been said. So, hence the importance of this various language network, various components of language network that can be imaged these days. So, having said that what I am trying to convey is there is a an entity called connectome you know when there is a cortical area that you can actually look at using the functional MRI 
and you can actually look at the various uh, white fibers, you know the Im imaging of white fiber called diffusion tensor imaging DTI. So, when you combine both what you actually get is a connectome where you can actually see the entire uh, structure of the particular circuit that you are studying. So, this is of curiosity I am trying to uh, cover this particular subject where imaging is definitely taking um, a, a very uh, high importance in the neural engineering. So, similarly that is the uh, sensory motor network and you will see various uh, cognitive networks or the apart from the basic structural uh, networks like sensory motor or visual and language you have various executive networks like dorsal uh, default mode networks and then you have a salience network where a person's saliency or priority map of the visual environment is taken care of and then of course you have central executive networks. So, these are of, of vital importance for uh, uh, for human endeavors you know a person who is working as a professional needs working memory he needs executive decision to be taken. So, those decisions uh, on a daily basis is in charge of you know of these particular targets that we are just discussing and these are available for imaging now. There is an entire group like Brainsight AI which is working to taking uh, these imaging into different levels where we can actually start helping patients with various uh, disorders. We can image this but we do not really have to open up completely and we can plan the plan any sort of surgeries beforehand and decide which is the part of the brain that needs to be explored and how we can actually preserve the vital functions of the brain. And these are the various attention networks that are uh, that can be imaged before we go in for surgeries. So, after covering various structural and imaging anatomy briefly I will touch upon the comparative anatomy because ultimately this course is for the uh, rodent experiments and rodent neuroanatomy and uh, various uh, serotactic surgeries that can be performed on rodents to gather a vital neural uh, signal data. We need to understand how uh, you know the comparison can be done with the uh, human skull and the human brain so that you really understand which part of the brain is actually can be uh, translated ultimately into the um, you know into humans when a particular research question is try, trying to get answers from the rodent experiments. So, having said that you can see this are the various part of the uh, human skull we have frontal bone, parietal bones and the occipital bones. So, the similar uh, there are color codings where this is the frontal bones parietal and the occipital bones. So, it is flattened from front to back and of course, you can see the volume is pretty less. So, the most important landmark in the rodent skull is bregma. Of course, you have bregma in the human skull as well where the sagittal suture and coronal suture meets to form bregma and the lambdoid suture and sagittal suture meets to form lambda. So, that is the lambda here. So, these two points of are of vital importance which I will be discussing it in, in detail when we discuss the rodent uh, stereotactic surgery because every experiment in rodent depends on these particular uh, stereotactic uh, coordinates which are completely based on these two anatomical landmarks of bregma and lambda. So, if you were to compare the anatomy the major difference one can easily make out is that the rodent brain does not have a sulci at all, it is a plain sheet of cortex whereas, human brain has n number of sulci and of course, it is big in volume and it encompasses a large um, sheets of uh, cerebral cortex which I discussed earlier. So, that is the major uh, difference and then there is a this deep hem hemispheric um, sulci and then there is the central sulcus that is seen in the human brain. Whereas, here the rodent brain you can make out that there is a cerebral cortex there and that is the cerebellum that is the only major division and of course, there is a very important olfactory bulb which as a species it is very very vital for the rodent to survive. So, those structures are highly evolved and very uh, obvious whereas, frontal parietal and occipital lobes are totally dependent on stereotactic coordinates that you are all going to use in the rodent experiments. So, it is very important 
that those coordinates are, are you know belongs to particular species, particular age of the rat because that is the that is one area where the inaccuracy can creep in because though the literature says some coordinate that coordinate may not match with your species of rat or your um, sort of size of the rat. So, it is very very important to really understand which part of the brain are you really dealing with because most of the time you make a small uh, twist drill hole and then deliver a drug or probably implant a sensor. You might think that you are implanting in motor cortex but because of the coordinate difference between different species you might end up in implanting it in parietal lobe and then your entire neural signal that you are going to read out is totally different. So, it is that is exactly the reason why this entire course has been planned so that the neural engineering goes I know that particular course goes in a particular direction uh, with uh, clear uh, neural data and neural signals which are informative are gathered. So, having said that obviously that is the sagittal orientation of the rodent brain and what I have um, what has been not shown this is this is just a representation but more or less it is featureless. So, you can see as opposed to the human brain where there are n number of sulci which is easy to divide it into frontal and temporal as I explained earlier whereas here we need to depend entirely on the stereotactic coordinates. So, uh, that is again the sagittal orientation if you take a mid sagittal section where you uh, vertically split into two halves of the brain that is th those are the structures that comes into view in the rodent brain. As I said there is a large olfactory bulb and then there is a cerebral cortex that is a central thalamus this is the mid brain mason cephalon is mid brain pons and medulla oblongata and that is the uh, human brain as I said where this is a mid brain pons medulla which is in put together forms a brain stem. If you all remember the basal surface I discussed that is the mid brain which holds the entire cerebral cortex which is then that and that is why it is called cross cerebri. So, briefly the functional divisions in the human brain and the rodent brain. So, it is very important again that to understand the different areas which I just discussed where as sensory motor area of the frontal lobe. This is the sensory that is the motor cortex that is the associative areas and of course, this is the speech area Broca's area Wernicke's area you know. So, by and large you can sort of uh, imagine and project it onto the rodent cortex very important to understand where exactly the motor cortex stops and the sensory cortex starts and there are primary sensory areas, secondary uh, motor areas, secondary sensory areas within these subdivisions and as I said that is entirely dependent on the stereotactic coordinates. So, another important uh, features in the brain that you need to remember is that though the various anatomical images clearly shows you all the structure that are needed in reality when you actually open up the skull of the rodent or the human brain you will see n number of blood vessels. So, this is sort of very important to understand because when you make a small hole as per your stereotactic coordinates and you enter in very next day probably the rodent might die. The reason being one of these vessels might have got ruptured. It may be easier to un, I know um, sort of avoid these vessels on the surface, but as you go deeper there are n number of vessels which comes in between. So, it is very important in humans it is possible to avoid because we have what is known as image guidance where we uh, the three dimensional volume data is exported onto the uh, image guidance where we can actually see the images slice by slice and plan a trajectory. Whereas, in rodent experiment uh, though the research is happening in that direction as well still it is not in vogue. And so, largely we are dependent on the stereotactic coordinates to plan our trajectories, but one has to remember to use these avascular or the area devoid of vessels to enter the brain and it is very easy to make out once you open you will see a lot of blood vessels which you can actually uh, coagulate as long as you are not studying that particular area of the brain to target the deeper structure if your uh, if your research question deals with the deeper targets. So, uh, before I conclude um, this particular um, as a lecture uh, 
I would want to want you all to uh, understand the intricacies and the beauty of the entire uh, neural engineering what has uh, you know led, uh, led to it and how it is making um, huge difference for patients life. So, this is one of our patients where in during the epilepsy surgery we map the um, data, we map the motor area before we actually begin the surgery. So, that has come out of such research in the neural uh, arena. So, on the right hand side you can see where the tungsten microneedle has been implanted into the motor cortex of the uh, rodent which is, has been anesthetized and fixed on the stereotactic frame. And with the uh, stimulation you can see the uh, left uh, forelimb is getting stimulated and the when there is repetitive adduction movement seen. This is akin to uh, um, this uh, particular uh, patient's brain where one can see when we stimulate the motor cortex he is able to move his hand, move the thumb area. So, the various areas of the brain will be mapped before we actually begin. So, that is the awake human surgery which can be performed for both for brain tumors and for uh, epilepsies. So, such is the uh, translational research that can happen in with the neural engineering and that is the importance of um, having the rodent experiments you know to, to understand these rodent experiments and then uh, get a valuable data out of it and make sense of it as to what you are dealing with and get a, a very good um, input for further uh, translational research. Thank you.